Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Wednesday, January 13th, 2021. On today's episode, we're going to discuss what we've been up to at the water cooler. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta. And joining me on this podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor, Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor, Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer, Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writer's Quatran Bowie. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hi. Okay, uh, I guess none of us have been doing anything this week. Uh, you know, we've all been like stationed at our in our homes watching the news. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's what we've been doing for this last week. But I did want to mention uh, something that hit this week. I I did over a month ago, uh, but when I visited Hawaii, I went to uh, Kulo Ranch in Oahu. And this is the ranch where they film many movie and TV productions. They filmed, uh, you know, the Jurassic Park films there. They filmed Lost. They filmed, uh, you know, uh, Jumanji. Any Anytime you see those, like, iconic uh, island-like mountains in the background, it is Kualoa Ranch. And they actually filmed stuff there that I didn't, wasn't aware that they filmed, like Karate Kid Part 2 the Okinawa scenes are actually in Hawaii, which I, I had no idea. Uh, anyways, we went there and we took a tour of the place. We went on this tour that was called the Jurassic adventure tour. It's one of their newest tours and it takes you to all the like Jurassic park, Jurassic world, uh, filming locations. And the tour guide gives you like all these little bits of information, some of which I actually, maybe I knew about and forgot about, but were kind of new to me. Um, so anyways, we, we made a video about that. We put it up on Ordinary Adventures. I'll link that in the show notes. And I, I just wanted to mention that because I, this, I'm this i really proud of this video. This video, I think, is uh, really good. And if you like movies, if you like the Jurassic Park films, uh, I think you'll get a kick out of this because it, it's interesting. They've actually, almost like um in New Zealand where they have Hobbiton, where they've like left up some of the sets. They've done the same thing here. Because the ranch, you know, makes a lot of money from these tours and stuff. So they part of the deal when uh, Jurassic World and other productions have come there is that they'll leave up, they'll reinforce these sets uh, so that they'll last longer than an average Hollywood set. And um, you get to, like, actually get up close and personal with uh, some of these things. So, uh, Ben, when you were in Hawaii, did you go to Kualoa Ranch? I did. They were filming Jurassic World at the time. So that was how long ago I was there. Uh, and they did not have any, you know, of the, uh, I saw some of your pictures and stuff on Instagram. They did not have any Jurassic World stuff up and available for the public yet because that movie hadn't even come out. How did you do the tour? Because I did it in like this, like bus. It was just like uh, Kitra and I and like this other fa- Hawaiian family was in the front of the bus. and We were in the back of the bus. Like, th- did you do like anything interesting? I remember like you were like ATV. Yeah, we did the ATV tour uh, there. And then we did uh, a separate ATV tour when we went to uh, Kauai recently in 2018. That was. Yeah, we saw some people ATVing while we were in our bus. And I, I, we almost did that. But then I was like, you know what? that seems a little like like you could get a little dirty and it seems like it's a lot more bumpier and we were trying to film it. So it was great. I would highly recommend doing the ATV (laughs) if you ever go back or if anybody out there is like planning a trip, you know, sometime in the future, it was like one of the coolest things. I I loved it, especially being in that location. Yeah. They also had like a horseback tour. We saw some people on horseback getting a tour of the ranch. I don't know. It was, it was really cool. Um, But uh, yeah. So uh, I'll put that link to that in the show notes. If you want to go watch that video, I uh, would appreciate it because we put a lot of work into it. Uh, but let's move on to what we've been reading. Jacob, what have you been reading this week? Uh, I'm still digging through my backlog of comics, making very good headway. I, I, uh, a few weeks ago, I had about 20 inches of unread comics stacked in the corner of my office. <laughs> now I'm down to about half of that. Uh, so I want to recommend a few titles I've been enjoying. And uh, they all, maybe coincidentally, maybe not, uh, a lot of really good horror comics from Image right now. I'll start with Stillwater, which is four issues in to which run. This is uh, written by Chip Zdarsky and illustrated by uh, Raymond Perez. And it's about a small rural town where nobody ages and nobody dies, which is a really, you know, a common setup. But I, what I like about this is that it's a horror series straight up. It is about if such a place existed. There's a place where you can get shot in the head, but be totally fine. Or you can go there and like, if you were born there, you would never age. You'd be an infant forever. What would this do to society? And how would people actually function? And what would the rules around this world be? 
and it's uh really good so far uh, really chilling and the world building is really thoughtful and sometimes very darkly funny and like i said it's still only four issues in we'll see how long it you know how much gas it has in the tank but still water is very good and very creepy and i recommend that one uh, for sure did you go over this because of Sex Criminals? Because he worked on Sex Criminals with Matt Fraction, right? Yeah, Chip Zdarsky, uh, I first knew his work as an artist, where he's a, he's a really incredible artist, and he drew Sex Criminals, which we talked about last time we were here, which ended poorly. Uh, but he's been writing a lot more than he's been illustrating recently. Like He uh, wrote a very acclaimed run in Daredevil. Um, he's doing a lot of Marvel stuff right now. He did a, a really excellent Howard the Duck <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, but this is him writing for Image and not drawing... Uh, but yeah, he's an incredibly talented writer. He's he, he's everything. He's he's an incredible artist, incredible writer. Um, and Sex Criminals problems and, and run was, was on him. The art was good till the end. Yeah. That was a, that was a writing issue. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what he keeps on keeps on doing as both a writer and an artist. Yeah, he also worked for the National Post for over a decade. So yeah, yeah he's he's unfairly talented. <laughs> what what else have you been reading? I've also read the first few issues of Family Tree, which is another image horror comic uh, written by Jeff Lemire, uh, who I've talked about before, who I really, whose work is really incredible. He's prolific. He's written for pretty much all the major companies, uh, uh, DC, Marvel, Image, Dark Horse, uh, and he writes superheroes and horror and like drama and just like, you know, down to earth stuff. He, he does everything. And Family Tree is a horror mystery comic that it's way too early in it. And it's actually ending its run soon. I'm just now catching up with it. I think it's, I think it's the plan is to have it be a 10 issue run, um, three issues in, and I'm finding it really compelling. It's about a family on the run who may have some kind of, um, strange illness, uh, that other people are hoping to track down and isolate. And I don't know what you want to say because the reveals in the first three issues were very strange and very satisfying. If I tried to explain them here, uh, I would not do them justice to how well portrayed in, 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 and really fascinating they are. So I'll say Family Tree, if you like good horror comics, and if you know Jeff Meyer's work, I know you're out there. Uh, this is very much worth your time. And I imagine since it's coming to an end soon, there'll be a big collecting, you know, big hardcover collecting all of it <laughs> at some point next year. That's what Image does. They All the series that, that you want to read will, will eventually be a hardcover <laughs> as you can buy and read it all in one sitting. You, you know, it's interesting that comic books feel like you were saying you didn't want to, you didn't want to give too much away. Like, I feel like comic books are like in a different medium where the inciting incident that is usually the thing that's sold by a movie trailer or whatever is a reveal in the comic book. And it's not something, you know, going in. Yeah. And I'll, uh, this extends to the next one I'll talk about. I'll talk about a dark horse comic called man or black. It is a uh, four issue mini series. Apparently the creators hope to do more in this universe, but it's written by Colin Bunn and Brian hurt who uh, interestingly Colin Bunn, wrote and brian hurt drew the six gun uh which is one of my favorite comics of all time and this artist series manor black is written by sorry illustrated by tyler crook who drew uh harrow county for writer colin bunn which is one of the best horror comics i've ever read so it's this really incredible live talent of colin bunn brian hurt and, and tyler crook just like people whose work i i i love like they, they just have such a great ear for dialogue and great eye for art and they do a lot of genre stuff that looks and feels genuinely unique. Like uh, Hertz art and Crooks art uh, are both similar in that they don't do realism. Their art is uh, a little bit more exaggerated, maybe not cartoonish is the wrong word, but they, they aim more for coherent storytelling and personality than for like, doing ultra realistic art and seeing that do horror comics ends up being extremely effective more so than someone trying to write, draw a really realistic monster or something more, more, uh, hits harder in the gut when it's a really well-told scene, even if the art is, you know, exaggerated or, you know, characterized just a little bit. But anyway, Man of Black is this, is their attempt to do a, a sort of a, um, uh, Americana version of a hammer horror story, you know, mansion full of immortal people, uh, young mage on the run, magical conspiracies, monsters, ghosts. Uh, it's only four issues. So I'm not going to spoil beyond that, but, uh, if you liked Harrow County or this or uh, the Six Gun, which like said the same teams overlapping worked on, uh, this is very good. I really enjoyed it, and they've it's been very silent to do more in this world. But I really hope they do more. Okay. Uh, uh, finally, a uh, very strange comic <laughs> debuted last uh, late last year called Crossover, and this is uh, written by Donnie Cates and illustrated by Jeff Shaw. 
and the idea behind this is an image comic is that some kind of strange portal opens in Colorado and the entire history of illustrated fictional characters from Batman to Scooby-Doo arrives in our universe. And, uh, and this, this issue deals with the fallout of what does the world do when the entire illustrated history of, of, of all characters who appeared in print in like illustrated print are, are now in our world and have caused untold numbers of deaths and destruction. <laughs> and, um, uh, it skates around, you know, uh, copyright and, and legal stuff pretty elegantly. It makes references to characters, uh, that you know who they're talking about without saying it. And who does choose to put, put front and center is very surprising and strange. Uh, rather than put, you know, Superman front and center because they can't use Superman, they put characters who they do have the rights to use. And it ends up being, if you're a comic fan, deeply bizarre. Uh, this is not a, a series for people who uh, aren't into comics already. It's very much a love letter to the medium and a dissection of the medium uh, in relation to our own world. But I'm not sure if it's good yet, but certainly ambitious. And I'm certainly going to see through it, at least for a little while longer. Jacob, you've intrigued me here, but I th- like I'm not sure if you have given us enough. Like, is there any way you can tell us some characters that are in here? I know that you were like trying not to because you didn't want to ruin the surprise, but I'm not sure I understand what kind of story this or what kind of characters are in this story. Because the thing is, the co- the comic book characters aren't the main characters. The main, the main characters are two comic shop employees who in this new world are essentially dealing in things that people find incredibly evil and wrong because it represents this new destructive force in their world who come across a apparently mundane, ordinary young girl who, who is from the comic book world. She slipped through when all this happened, but is not a, a, like for a better lack of a, for lack of a better phrase, an IP driven character. She's just an ordinary civilian who's been separated from her family and they go on a quest across Colorado try to deliver her back to her family in a world where comic characters are literally being hunted down and rounded up or killed. And, and along the way they meet, like I said, very niche comic book characters who image comics is allowed to use. And I don't want to spoil it because if you do know those characters, it's a, it's an absolute riot how they're used. And it's really funny. So I'm not going to say anything more than that, but that's basically gist of the plot. It's not about Batman. <laughs> It is about okay. ordinary people in a world where Batman, who is a fictional character, is suddenly right there. But Batman is not actually in it. So it's image characters. It's not like public domain like Sherlock Holmes. Oh, no, no. It, it, um, the characters who have shown up so far are characters who are either owned, creator-owned, and clearly have permission to be used, or are famous image characters, which is very strange. Image does not have a lot of like truly famous superhero characters. But if you are, if you know comics, you will know the image character who shows up at the end of, the, of issue three, uh, because uh, uh, I kind of gasped when it happened because it was it was the last person I expected to show up in, in this comic book. Okay, very cool. Now, now I'm going to have to download this and <laughs> read it. Uh, any more comics? That's it for now. Like I said, I'm making my way through my massive stack. Um, the truth is, I kept on buying comics through, throughout quarantine. I'd make my weekly trip to the comic store with my mask on during, you know off hours my, my store took it very seriously but during quarantine uh i just fell behind and my comic stack just grew and grew and grew and uh, over the next few weeks i'm hoping to get back down to you know reading what i buy every week <laughs> so i'll have yeah. more updates as i do that yeah i've been still reading or listening to charles soul's light of the jedi this is the first book in the high republic line of star wars books and i'm not far in i'm like probably about reaching halfway at this point but i just wanted to plug it if anybody wants to get into that whole series this new era of star wars stories that takes place 200 years before the prequels i am listening on audible and the production value i mean this is true of almost all the star wars books like they have the music they have sound effects the the person who's doing it does different voices um i i wouldn't say it's like a radio play but it's more like towards radio play than it is just a audiobook reading. So if, if you, I don't know, I, I go to sleep to it. Like I, cause I, when I'm listening to audiobooks, I can't be doing other things or I'll like lose track and then I'll have to like rewind because I realized I was like looking at something or doing something and totally missed like the last two paragraphs. But um, I did want to put that out there. Okay. Let's move on to what we've been watching. Uh, 
I this past week I I think David Chen mentioned Underwater. This is a movie that came out in 2020, maybe. I think it might have come out in 2020. It did it seems... because it, it made our top 50 uh, moments of the year list. A very key reveal is yeah. number 39 wow. on our list. Peter, if you listen to our top moments podcast, Chris mentioned it as well. Yeah, I, I have been listening to that as well. I have not gotten through the whole podcast of that. Um, the Okay, well, this is now on HBO Max. And this is from director William Eubank, who directed the 2014 film The Signal, which I saw and loved at Sundance. And that's the signal that is not the movie that came out years before. That was a zombie movie that also premiered at Sundance that I liked. <laughs> that's confusing. Um, but uh, I had heard so many bad things about this movie. And I don't know. I was like, you know, I like this director. Brian Duffeld, that is the, the screenwriter, is supposed to be like a really good, hot screenwriter. Um, and I know K-Stew. We, we all love K-Stew. Um, and I thought the trailer looked good. So I, we put it on the other night and, uh, the opening scene, which, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not going to, to hide back because it, the opening scene is the trailer of the movie. It's like they're in this underwater base and the structural integrity of the base starts failing. And it's this very intense scene. I'm like watching this scene. Um, and I'm thinking like, why did people not like this movie? This, this is like really good. Um, and then the rest of the movie came. <laughs> uh, I will say case Stu is trying her best. Like, you know, I said that opening scene um, was intense. I feel like it's almost as intense as the intensity that case Stu gives with every line of her performance in this movie. But um, it's an action sci-fi thriller. It's trying to be Abyss or Aliens, but I think it's just kind of being like a boring, boring, like Meg or Deep Blue Sea. Or, I don't know. I don't even boo, know. You, Peter, Peter, boo, Peter. Boo. If you, we've talked about this this movie on the podcast five or six times. We, we, you are so far in minority on Underwater. <laughs> Am I really? You, you really are. This movie's awesome. This movie's I, know. So good. I, I, I was it, it was so bad I turned it off, so I didn't finish it. What, um, Peter? Yeah. I, I, I just not, was not into it. It was boring. Oh, uh, it's not boring at all. It's so fun. Yeah, Chris wrote a very positive review in January of last year, and we've been riding the underwater train as, as hype men for this movie <laughs> for over a year. Oh. Now you show up a year later, the crap at our parade, Peter. This is no fun. No good. I, I'll concede well, that, it, that it's derivative for sure, but I still had a blast with it. Well, I'll just say that uh, I am in the majority here. I might not be in the minority of of, of the cheerleading squad here on Slash Film. I don't think that's I, true, Peter. Uh, everybody, what are you I, talking about? everybody I know in the film world likes Underwater. You are the first person I've talked to who said it's not good. I'm looking this up right now, Jacob. <laughs> this, this movie got horribly di- like eviscerated on Rotten Tomato. It does, yeah. It, it does have a forty-seven percent. Forty-seven percent. Even IMDb, it's like five point something. Like I don't know. I think I think I after know. the fact, people found this movie and said, "Hey, this movie's pretty good." And I have seen the, the the tide turn on Underwater in a pretty significant way. Chris, back me up here. People like Underwater, right? I I hate to be the person who's like, "How dare you dislike a movie?" Everyone is allowed to dislike what they like. That said, Underwater is a lot of fun. I mean, if Peter doesn't like it, that is that is his right, <laughs> and I won't I won't judge him too harshly for that. I do, but I do think. It's it's a fun movie. It's not a groundbreaking movie. It doesn't do anything new. It's very derivative of Alien and The Abyss, but that's okay. Sometimes you know, sometimes it's okay to have a movie that uh, is is selling exactly what it's advertising. Under Underwater was sold as a a monster movie in you know a, a, an aquatic horror movie. That's exactly what it is. It gave me exactly what I wanted. I I, I have no complaints about the film. I don't know, maybe I got to watch more of it, but I was just getting bored. But okay. Uh, so if you want to listen to me, don't watch Underwater on HBO Max. But if you want to listen to the rest of this crew, uh, it was apparently had some of the best scenes of should, 2020. It has one of the 50 best scenes of 2020. And you should absolutely see this movie in an email, Peter, <laughs> with your thoughts on Underwater. Oh, uh, no. Please don't, because I'm probably not going to go re- go back and rewatch it. And I feel really bad because I, I really like the director. And yeah, I don't know. 
But uh, okay, I want to talk about other things I I saw this week. Um, I saw you know one of the the best shows of the last decade came back on the air this week, and I'm ta- of course I'm talking about Penn and Teller's Fool Us, which uh, had, uh, second se- uh, half of the season. Uh, this is actually pretty interesting, guys. I know you guys hate Fool Us. Or this is why this is why you didn't show. like Underwater. You were so anxious to watch Fool Us. I was. I'll tell you why I was anxious to watch Fool, watch Fool Us. Well, first of all, the first half of the season, which was supposed to be the whole season, was filmed in the days leading up to the COVID uh, lockdown. So, actually, if you watch some of the episodes of that that first half of the season, like it becomes weird, where like people aren't like touching each other like you know it, it, they were like one of the last productions like actually filming um before everything got locked down they actually went like a couple days over what other stuff was doing in hollywood anyways uh they decided cw needed some content they asked fool us to come back and, and do it uh second half of the season and the interesting thing here is they are doing it during covid so they had to create this whole uh, COVID bubble in the Rio hotel in Las Vegas, where all the performers had to come there for, I think it was like two weeks or 10 days or something like that and stay inside the hotel. Penn and Teller were also staying inside the hotel. And what's interesting here um, is that it is magicians performing on stage to an empty theater. The only two people that are in the theater are Penn and Teller. And behind them is just a wall of monitor screens showing spectators reactions, which I'm not even completely convinced that it is like real reactions of, of those moments. I think it might just be canned reactions, kind of like how you have canned like audience reactions on, on shows and stuff like that. Um, but it, it's very interesting to see how this is done because magic really relies on, uh, interactions between spectator and the magician, like someone picking a card, someone it, it being an interactive experience. And like, especially magic's very hard to capture on video. And I think it really depends on that. So it's very interesting to see like, you know, Alison Hannigan, the the host of this show, having to do things on stage uh, more than six feet apart from the magician uh, for the first time ever, they, actually pre-recorded some of these acts around the world, like in stages around the world, and then projected it on the screen on the stage so that they could appear and actually have like these, it has, it has allowed them to have a more international uh, presence of magicians there. And also some bigger stuff that you normally can't like travel with like these big illusion kind of things uh, around the world. Um the uh but the acts do appear live on screen kind of like uh with zoom and uh yeah i don't know it, it's it's interesting i'm not gonna say it's better i i, I think it's probably t- fair to say that it probably isn't as good because it's acting under these kind of these these constraints these creative constraints but i think when you act under these cre- creative constraints in any medium i think that makes for something interesting i will say that this first episode of this second half of the season has Pete Samuelson's version of wild card, which is this magic retelling of invasion of the body snatchers. And he does it with uh, playing cards. And it's something I've seen live. He's a very theatrical magician and it's just wonderful. Uh, Anyways, I'm not going to convince you guys to watch fool us, but I do think it's very interesting. I've also been watching um, shark tank, which is also (laughs) been one of those shows that has been, in production in a bubble in Vegas. And it's interesting to see how, how they've adapted to COVID with like, you know, all the different sharks being like more than six feet apart and how they have to like, sometimes the sharks have to like be presented with like, you know, sample products and stuff and how the, the dance that they have to do under the circumstances of, you know, being filmed in 2020 is just so very interesting and fascinating. But um, that's on CW. That is Fool Us. And I think Shark Tank is on ABC, probably. Um, the, the thing I do want to sell to you guys. The, like, Okay, I'm not, not going to make you guys watch Penn & Teller's Fool Us, a magic show on CW. But the thing I do want every one of you guys to watch. This is coming on January 22nd on Hulu. This is a show called In and of Itself. It is something I saw in, when... It, on its first day in LA and it went 
to do over 500 days of performances in New York off Broadway. This is, I think to call it a magic show is, is like, um, I don't know. It would be to dismissive of what it is because it's, it has magic, but it's kind of a one man show. It's, it's a show. It, Derek Delgadio is the guy that is at the, the center of this. He's the creator. He's the performer. Um, and it's it's directed by Frank Oz, who you know as Yoda and the director of uh, some really good films as well. Uh, it um, has a great score. Uh, it, it's a show about identity, um, the weight of secrets, how we define ourselves, how we define others, how others choose our value, how story changes how people define us. Um, I don't know. I'm very interested to see what you guys think of this because I, I really didn't think that this is a show that could translate well in a recorded medium. Magic in itself is no pun intended. It is very, very hard. I think when you videotape it, because people then question, are there visual effects here? Are there like, you know, you know, they, there's other questions there and the misdirection doesn't work the same on video as it does in an actual person. But I was surprised at how well this, this show translated. And I'm wondering if that's because I have had the experience of being there in person and I'm watching it and it, 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 I'm connecting the dots or if it is actually just as good of a show. So I want to, want to see what you guys think. And I hope you guys give this a chance. Um, it is filmed. I, I, I want to say it's filmed in the way that I, Okay, before I make the statement, I want to say that Hamilton is one of the best things I saw last year, period. That said, I think there was some marketing that, you know, they they filmed Hamilton in this, like, very cinematic way that it's not just a recording of a, of, of a stage play. And I was kind of disappointed in that. This, I think, accomplishes some of what I was hoping they were going to do when, when they when kind, of, kind of positioned that in the marketing they they do some very creative like what Frank Oz does here. He does some creative zoom outs to reveal things. What he does with the camera positioning, the cinematography. Uh, there's even like this is different than the actual show because you actually get voiceover commenting on the production. You have vintage footage of Derek's childhood to fill out some of this stuff. You get some crude and artful animation of some of the stories. Um, the other interesting thing here is it's taken from multiple performances and you see the reactions from many different people. Uh, I'll say this. I, I know I'm a big fan of magic and I've probably gone way too long about magic on this particular podcast. I apologize. But as a magician, as a fan of the art of magic, I, I will say that magic as an art form, I think is very much in its infancy. And right now it relies too much uh, on shock and surprise and it isn't um, what it could be. It, it it does not reach the levels of what film or books or other art form, even music do because it's not, it, it just relies on these gimmicky twists and surprises and reveals. And I think what Derek Delgadio is doing with the show is pushing magic into a direction of what is possible with this medium. And, um, I don't know. It, 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 like, honestly, every time I've seen the show, it, it has brought me to tears. Uh, as I said, there's points in the show where we see different reactions from different people. There's a point in the show where um, someone is chosen out of the audience to come back tomorrow. They leave without seeing the ending of the show. And they're given this log book that has been written in every performance. Everybody, everybody that gets picked to leave the show writes in this log, log book, their experience thus far and the ending they imagine it to, to ha the show to have. And they return the next day to recite uh, what they wrote before and what, and get to actually see what actually happens. Uh, so you get to see like different variations of that. When you saw it in person in New York off Broadway, um, you only got to, see your particular thing you get to hear it's interesting because you get to see multiple different people there's a i'll say this lastly uh there is 
this moment in the show where a member of the audience is randomly selected to come on stage and they choose a letter out of a pile of letters to open and read on stage. And it is from, I'm going to spoil this part. It is from someone they know. And it's so amazing seeing the reactions of not just the person that was in my audience, but seeing 10 different people had this reaction with different connections of person, persons they've had. Um, it's brilliant. The, 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 the trick at the end of the show that he performs literally touches every single member of his audience in a personal way. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, this, this is going to be the end of it. Sorry. I've talked about magic this long, but please put in and of itself on your like must see list. It's coming out on January 22nd on Hulu. I got to see a screener. I've seen it three times now. And that's that's how much I love it. So anyways, highly recommend it. Jacob, what have you been watching? Uh, I spent the past few weeks watching movies nonstop and then editing like a week and a half's worth of top 10 lists and end of year features and uh, overseeing the creation of the top 50 moments list. So I'm on a movie break. I'm not watching movies. I am watching Discovery Plus and only Discovery Plus, which means that I am only watching episodes of Deadliest Catch, the Discovery show about crab fishermen uh, in the Bering Sea. That's all I'm doing, Peter. Uh, my wife and I call it The Crab Show. We don't call it, we don't call it Deadliest Catch. We call it The Crab Show. Do you want, do you want to watch an episode of The Crab Show? Let's do another crab show. Let's do one more <laughs> crab show before bed. And uh, we watch these tough, grizzled sailors catch crab for like hours on end and i do other things while i do it like i I paint miniatures or i uh organize cards for my board games or i clean the kitchen or i scrub things or i brush my cats and uh it's been amazing to not watch movies for a week and just watch crab fishermen on the crab show interesting so what (laughs) what is like a give us an example of what what happens on one of these shows have you never seen Deadliest Catch, Peter? No. Uh, Deadliest Catch has been running for 16 years on, on Discovery Channel. It's one of their big breakout hits uh, that kind of, for better or for worse, and often for worse, kind of redefined their trajectory for a bit as a network. Uh, but unlike most of the imitators, Deadliest Catch is actually good. And it's just uh, each season is a camera crew of two is embedded on board uh, fishing vessels going to catch uh, first king crab, then opelio crab later in the year. And it is literally the world's most dangerous job. Statistically, more people die crab fishing than they do flying fighter jets uh, and like other major jobs. It is, it is a it is a very very deadly job. People can drown. They can hit by heavy equipment. <laughs> Boats can overturn. Uh, the, the first couple seasons, uh, I I watched it back in the day, back when I, I was still working retail during college, coming home, turning on the DVR and watching <laughs> episodes from five seasons five and six of Daily Sketch. But I've never seen it from the beginning, so that's what I'm doing now. But season one and two feature boats being overturned and daring rescues from Coast Guard and human stories of people swinging big and missing hard and these grizzled old tough guys wondering how am I going to make it through the next day if I can't find the crab. It is just the most... Uh, compelling pseudo reality pseudo documentary crap out there it is just i'm incredibly invested in the world of these crab fishermen now so much of i've been reading up all the articles <laughs> about how crab fishing has changed in the past 20 years uh because of and thanks to deadliest catch in many ways and the show is very controversial in alaska for how, for how for its influence on actual laws regarding crab fishing uh Anyway, Deadliest Catch, it, like I said, it is just for you back. It's really, really um, compelling background noise. I, I'm never paying 100% attention to it, but it's just amazing footage, amazingly edited footage of these old sh- fishing vessels, like going over rough waters, collecting crab and laying the crab on the deck. And them saying, these crab have too many barnacles on them. We can't sell them. This one's a pregnant crab. We can't sell it. We, we can only sell male crabs above this size. And they cry about their families because they haven't seen them in weeks. It's very good. Uh so this is you're saying this is the first couple seasons so this is from 17 years ago uh yeah the first season is 2005 i believe and the production value is still that good from oh, back yeah, I mean, then? It, it, it's not as good as it looks now the show now is much slicker but the footage is still incredible uh they're they're they're, they're getting amazing stuff and like I said, this is not incredible television this is not like 
I'm not gonna sit here and tell you, oh, you must watch this. this I like this in the same way that you like. I think you like, um, like, like, like maybe you like Survivor, Peter. It's really incredibly well made junk food. I'm not saying you should watch it. I don't think you would enjoy it, Peter. But as far as like background noise goes, I think Deadly Catch may be the best background noise TV show of all time. Okay, maybe I'll have to add that to my list, Jacob. Like I said, I can't. No promises. <laughs> no promises. It, it, you, the, the asterisk is you must be willing to at least be interested in the world of crab fishing, which somehow I am. Somehow. But you were interested before you saw the show. No, I didn't know that, but I, I learned that I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I hate to go back to in and of itself. There was one thing I wanted to bring up. The, the, the movie begins with a text on screen notice asking the audiences watching this to turn off their phones and put them down for the remainder of the presentation. Have you guys ever seen that before? I don't think I've ever seen that. No, but I have seen a full crab pot being lifted up to save a ship by ample feature. <laughs> uh okay well the thing that brought this to mind jacob is you said that this is like a wonderful like you know have it on in the background kind of thing and i think in and of itself is the complete opposite where like literally on screen it tells you if you are on your phone or doing something else you know you may as well not watch this well it is required by law to be doing something else while you watch deadly sketch (laughs) brad what have you been watching I uh, am continuing my journey through the entire series of Friends, and I just recently finished season three, uh, which was a very fun season. And I'm just going to mention some of the, 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 the funner points of this season, including uh, John Favreau having an arc in this season for six episodes as uh, this software millionaire who dates Monica. Um, and there's even a, a funny, uh, almost, almost prescient uh star wars reference to him being so rich that he owns two life-size stormtrooper statues which i thought was fairly amusing um and he's he's really fun on the show uh there's also a, an interesting like thing that i uh i was so surprised by um billy crystal and robin williams appear briefly in uh the cold open for one of the episodes and it's just a random bit where they're in the coffee house and robin williams puts on uh, this strange accent and he's like gushing to Billy Crystal about his wife having an affair and he thinks that she's having an affair with like a, 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 a the, their doctor or something like that but then Billy Crystal reveals that he's the one having an affair and they have this whole fight and then they leave and I was like why and how did this happen and I guess they were shooting something nearby I, I thought it was going to be something like Father's Day they're um, really poorly reviewed and received um, comedy they did together around the same time the season was being made but apparently it was something else. And then it ended up being perfectly timed that when this episode came out, it was like a right around the time the movie came out. So I don't know if no one ever figured out that maybe this was something that was planned, but they made it seem like it was like an accident or whatever. Um, but I, I, apparently they did this cold open like improvisationally where they, they, they came around and were on set and they decided to try to do something with them because they were there, which was crazy to me. And then I've also had fun like noticing how the appearance of the actors changed based on what they were working on at the time. Like all of a sudden Matt LeBlanc has kind of a terrible short haircut and it's because it's the haircut he had for lost in space. And then you see (laughs) Courtney Cox's uh, haircut with the red streaks in it that she had for scream two. And then you have things where I, since I finished season three, I've now seen the first couple episodes of season four. And it's funny that they really didn't care about certain continuity things as far as their appearance, because Matthew Perry um, has his hair look um, much lighter in color and longer in length from the end of season three to the end of season four. And normally that wouldn't be a big deal in a lot of shows, but in particularly uh, at the end of season three, there the episode takes place at a beach house and the beginning of season four starts at the beach house just moments after the end of season three. <laughs> so there's no reason his hair should have changed that significantly uh, between the seasons. So uh, it's funny just to see how like certain th- continuity, uh, you know, errors and such like that have been, you know, they pay more attention to them nowadays, I think, with with shows or they but try Brad, to avoid them. What what year would that have come out in? What year would have would what have come out in? That For, season finale. Not 1997. So back then, were like DVDs, like were people binging through the seasons on DVD even a thing? No, I don't. I don't even. I don't think DVDs were out then because I. 
I specifically remember when, when I got my DVD player, I think it was like the year 2000 or 2001. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think they were a thing yet. And I think that the only way you could rewatch TV shows is if you happen to catch reruns. Cause I don't, I'm not even sure if they were releasing shows on VHS at that point, really. I'd have to go, yeah, so, go find out. So I'm betting it's something that they're like, oh, we don't have to worry about that because no one's going to watch those back to back. No one will ever notice. <laughs> Just in case anybody's screaming at their podcast player, uh, DVDs were released in late 1996, but I'm guessing they were prohibitively expensive for a little while anyway. Yeah, because so. I, I remember in 2000, I had to save up to buy my DVD player. Like I used my Christmas and birthday money to buy a three disc DVD changer and DVDs were also still fairly expensive at the time. But, okay, what else have you been watching, Brad? Um, I've also been, uh, gotten back into Downton Abbey. Um, kind of took a, not, not like an intentionally an intentional break, but just never came back around to it. And I realized that um, we had stopped just before the second season finale, which uh, customary with British television is in like an hour and a half special. I think that's part of the reason why I didn't necessarily take the dive immediately because it feels like I'm watching a movie uh, because it's it's so long. And it's a Christmas episode, but man, the season two finale was mostly depressing. <laughs> and so I'm really glad that we didn't like watch it around Christmas or anything, thinking like, oh man, this is going to be a nice little little thing because uh, some really sad stuff happens in this in this episode. But it, it does end on a, a high note. And I, it's interesting because I do really like the show. My girlfriend's seen all of it and she loves it. Um, and I, but I, I find myself having to be like in a very specific kind of mood because it's a li- bit more of a slow burn kind of show, and it's. Um, you know, Brit- British drama. And so I just have to be in a, where like it's not late at night. So I'm not super tired because the show's not boring, but it's just a very soft, quiet kind of show that has the the tendency to like make me a little more tired. Um, but it's a very good show. And so I'm uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be continuing to to get through it and uh, so I can catch up and, and, and see the movie. Uh, Brad, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm very eager for you to get to a certain point. I think it's the end of season three. I have not seen it, but my wife was super into the show until the season three finale where she cold cut it out of her life, refused to watch it again, and oh. never, it angered her so much into season three that she said, nope, done, never again, and she <laughs> has not watched any of it ever again, including the movie. So I'm very curious. I, I, I want you to check back in when you get to the end of season three. Interesting. I will definitely do that. The other thing I want to mention is, uh, yeah, uh, Ben was right that DVD started in the late 1990s. The DVD boom didn't really start to happen until late 2001, early 2002. So, and, and that's with movies. So I'm not even sure at that point, like, I think, yeah, they I think even TV, thought that TV shows, were, I don't even think were like a thing where you could like, yeah. readily buy them very much um, on DVD because I think that that, if I remember correctly, I think that the, the reason that TV shows started to gain more popularity was kind of in conjunction with, or maybe it, maybe it, maybe it was vice versa. Maybe this caused this. But I know that Family Guy being on DVD and finding popularity with audiences was a big reason that the show got picked back up by Fox and made a comeback. So I don't I'm not sure which which came first, whether it was DVDs of being on TV that made Family Guy popular, or if Family Guy being on DVD showed people, oh hey, we should put our shows out on DVD. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So uh, Brad, Brad, did you, you have more to say about Downton Abbey? No, that's pretty much it. Okay, Chris, what have you been watching? Uh, I watched Pretend It's a City, which is a new seven part, uh, I guess you call it a docuseries on Netflix that Martin Scorsese directed. And it's about Fran Lebowitz, who is a a writer. Uh, and she's, um, she's great. It's, uh, even if you don't really know who Fran Lebowitz is, or if you've never read any of her stuff, I I really recommend you watch this because it's just delightful. Um, it's, it's not really a about Fran Lebowitz as much as it is about New York City and uh, you know her, her lifestyle and, and you know what she, what it was like you know in the seventies and the eighties and stuff like that. It, it's it's kind of like a, a tour through various New York City historical landmarks and stuff like that. But it's all filtered through Fran Lebowitz, who uh, just complains about everything, and it's delightful. And it's not like an annoying sort of complaint. It's just you know she's you know uh, a, a curmudgeon if you will and she just <laughs> hates everything in, in an amusing way and uh, what makes this really enjoyable is the whole thing is Fran Leibowitz and Martin Scorsese just you know talking about stuff and it's clear that Martin Scorsese thinks Fran Leibowitz is is the funniest person 
on earth because 90% of this docuseries is just Martin Scorsese laughing his ass off at everything she says. And uh, there are parts where he's laughing like so hard. You can tell he's like in physical pain from just laughing so hard. There's a part where he has to stop and hold his stomach and compose himself because it looks like he's going to rupture something. And it's just, it's just delightful and funny and charming. And it's a wonderful distraction from everything going wrong at right now because everything is kind of a nightmare so uh i watched it like the other night uh, i like binge through all seven they're only like a half hour long so it's not like a long thing so i binge through all of it and the minute it ended i was like man i want to watch that again because it was so just charming and funny and uh like i said distracting um on the opposite end of the specs from the something that isn't charming or funny or distracting is cherry which is the new russo brothers movie starring tom holland um uh, I'm I'm embargoed from reviewing this for a while, but I can talk about it. You know, I get social sentiment, so let's call this that. Uh, it's not good. It's it's 150 minutes long. Uh, you feel every single one of those minutes. You just want it to end. Uh, I did not care for it. Tom Holland is very good in this. This is probably the best performance I've I've seen him give. Um, you know, I never thought Tom Holland was a bad actor, but I didn't think he was like a great actor. I just thought he was fine he's a likable guy he's likable as spider-man uh but i there was there's never been a part where i was like wow tom holland is a really good actor but he's he's really good in this so uh i'm not gonna say it's worth seeing for him because it's really not but uh he he's like the one saving grace in the film and then finally i watched the straight story which is streaming on disney plus and this is of course um david lynch's Disney movie and it's like David Lynch's only movie that has a G rating and I just had never seen this even though I was aware of it and for some reason I just put off seeing it and all this time I kind of was thinking like well even though it's a David Lynch movie it's going to be a watered down David Lynch movie because it's a Disney movie but it's actually surprisingly uh, David Lynchy or Lynchian if you will where <laughs> there's just you know a lot of weird surreal stuff in the movie that uh, it works really well but this movie is is wonderful it's it's just this uh, low key, low stakes, emotional movie. It's, it's based on a true story about this guy, this this older gentleman, his 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 brother who he hadn't seen in years had a stroke, and uh, this gentleman he he couldn't drive, and he had no one to drive him, and so he literally rode his lawnmower uh, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of miles to go. It was a like a, a riding John Deere lawnmower. He rode it hundred hundred miles to go visit his brother, and it took him like six weeks and he got there. So the movie is just about his journey as he, you know, rides across uh, the Midwest. It's, it's just a, a delightful little film. And when it was over, I was just like, man, I wish David Lynch would make, you know, even though I love David Lynch's weird, violent movies, I kind of wish he would, he would make another movie like this where it's a nice film for lack of a better term word. So the straight story now streaming at Disney plus. I haven't seen that movie in so many years. It, it does make me wonder, like, why he was pulled to that. Why he decided to do that. I don't, I mean, uh, it's it's definitely not like a hired gun thing where, where Disney was like, we need David Lynch. Because everyone involved with the film is people, are people he normally works with. Like his normal production designer. And uh, uh, I forget the name of the writer, but it's someone he, he works with all the time. So it's not just like, you know, oh, we need to find someone to do this he, he clearly was invested in the story so i'm not i don't really know the whole backstory and how it came about but uh i i i highly recommend checking it out if you haven't watched it ht what have you been watching i have been watching a bunch of just classic screwballs because that's the genre that i tend to turn to uh, as a distraction it's a it's comfort viewing for me and i decided to watch a couple that i hadn't seen before the first of which is I Married a Witch, uh, which I found whilst just uh, browsing through HBO Max. And the title and premise of the movie seemed so ridiculous to me that I was like, right, well, now I need to watch it. Um, and it stars Veronica Lake as a witch who um, basically has a plan for revenge against uh, this man's family after uh, this man in like, I don't know, 15, the 1500s uh, sentences her and her father to burn. And she uh, returns in modern 1940s uh, to find the descendant of this man and um, 
plans to wreak havoc on his life by making him fall in love with her. But she accidentally falls in love with him. And uh, this man is a politician and he gets married to her uh, and unwittingly it unwittingly gets married to her and doesn't realize that she's a witch and hijinks ensue. It's a deeply, deeply silly movie, even by like classic comedy, like screwball comedy standards. It's just, it's very, very silly. Like uh, Veronica Lake, who I realized uh, upon watching this, I hadn't seen her in any movies before any of her movies. I had only like known of her name, I guess, as a, as a pinup um, and as just kind of, pop culture osmosis and i i hadn't really i yeah this is the first movie i've seen of her and she's she's very beautiful um i can it's interesting to it was more interesting to me after watching this movie to dive into her wikipedia and uh just see kind of the tragic career that she had that is very common with a lot of classic hollywood starlets and uh like for example she her career died down after starring in a couple of noirs and comedies such as this and she at one point was like waiting tables in a hotel and uh died early on of uh, alcoholism or something and it's a very tragic story and something that um I feel like has made her name even more memorable in terms of cinematic history because she's one of those tragic dead blondes. Um, but A Married Witch is very divorced from that uh, legacy that her career has left and her life has left. Uh, yeah, it's a very silly movie. I don't really have anything to say about it except, you know, silly, very silly, silly movie. <laughs> <laughs> The other movie I watched uh, is a much more well-known classic, and that's Bringing Up Baby, the uh, Howard Hawks movie starring Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn. And I had um, I had been wanting to watch this for a while. I never got around to it. Uh, and I love a good Katherine Hepburn, Cary Grant team up, even though the Philadelphia story left a bit of a sour taste on my tongue because of how the movie treated Katherine Hepburn. Um, and Bringing Up Baby, she's much more along the lines of that scatterbrained heiress that is very common with the genre. Uh, Cary Grant sort of beleaguered the entire time as this straight man who's pulled along with her schemes. Uh, she, her, the heiress uh, basically finds herself owning this, uh, was it Tiger? Yeah, a Tiger. No, what was it? It, it was a... Uh, I think it's a leopard. leopard. Yeah, a leopard. And uh, <laughs> they uh, basically have to get it to her her like ra- her like aunt's ranch upstate or something. And um, they have like this leopard in the back of this car and it accidentally like, escapes through this downtown area and all these, again, hijinks ensue. It's um, got that real rat-a-tat uh, dialogue and energy that uh, you can find in many a Howard, Howard Hawks film. But it is very intense, like... A lot of things happen, happen, and I think Ben had actually talked about this a while ago on the water cooler where he, he, he said it was, I think he said it was like almost too screwball for you that you just couldn't stand it. Yeah, it was just, it was cranked to 11 seemingly the whole time. And it was like, I, I'm a big fan of this genre, but it was like, yeah, it was, it was very much with a capital M. Yeah, I did like it a lot though. I like how... Uh, Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant, when they are playing off each other and bouncing off each other, they're so fun. They're so just like, again, like rat-a-tat, so quick and sparkling. And their physical comedy uh, is just beyond. I really love them. Cary Grant is so good at playing the, um, uh, what's, I can't remember the word that I was thinking of, but, you know, sort of like the, not the, both the straight man, but also the, um, the guy who gets, well, there's like a word for it, but I can't remember what it is. Like put upon? <laughs> yeah, the put upon guy. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the, uh, I, don't, I, I keep thinking of doofus. But I don't think that's the right word. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, they're both great in it. Um, I had a fun time with it, even though I was quite stressed through most of it. <laughs> but it was, it's a fun one. Um, and that's Bringing Up Baby. I think I saw it also on HBO Max. Yeah. And Hepburn, like that was her first comedy, right? Uh, I, I think, think so. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it is. But anyways, okay. Uh, what else have you been watching? HD? I'm sorry to, to derail. Us. No, no, it's okay. I just didn't have the the fact in front of me, but I'm sure you're right. Um, the last movie I watched was Earwig and the Witch, which is the new Studio Ghibli movie directed by Goro Miyazaki. Uh, it's the first CG animated feature from the studio, and um, it's not great. And that pains me to say as one of the, probably one of the biggest Studio Ghibli fans, uh, this is the third feature film from Goro Miyazaki, who's the son of Hayao Miyazaki. 
the probably most famous director, uh, not only of Ghibli, but of like Japanese animation. And um, I have seen his, I've seen Goro Miyazaki's past films, uh, Tales of Ursi and uh, From Up on Poppy Hill. And Tales of Ursi was probably the first movie from Studio Ghibli that I was severely disappointed in because it is just, uh, it's a really empty, though except it's an exceptionally beautiful, but empty mess. Um, and Goro Miyazaki himself comes from the, uh, I think, architecture world. He didn't intend to uh, begin an, a career in animation because of his very famous father. And uh, he kind of got pulled into directing Tales from Earthsea uh, by Ghibli producer Isao Takahata and then kind of began his anime uh, director career from then. And where... He has been slowly improving. I, I remember watching Tales from uh, from Up on Poppy Hill and seeing some potential and promise in that. Like it felt like the soul that was missing from Tales of Earthsea was finally starting to peek through in from Pop, from Up on Poppy Hill. And um, what Goro's style does is it feels like he is very much like imitating the, the style and the beauty and uh, and it animation of Hayao Miyazaki uh I have a whole theory about about Goro Miyazaki's attempts to become a, a well-regarded director but that's only that's more like in terms of just like the sons of, of celebrated artists and kind of their own um insecurities for that but that's just like a whole other thing uh but it feels very much like an imitation of that uh and I felt like he had lost some of the heart or doesn't hasn't had a grasp on the heart that Miyazaki uh, Hayao Miyazaki has uh, shown so well, and we see a little bit of that from Up on Poppy Hill, and a little bit more in uh, Earwig and the Witch, uh, but it's just uh, it feels very incomplete, is what I will say. Not only does the animation feel incomplete, the CG animation looks really terrible. It looks like an unrendered, uh, made for TV CG animated film. Uh, but the plot itself feels incomplete. It feels like the lead up to a story that doesn't start until the very end. And then it just kind of ends. Hmm. But it's just, it's a very sweet film. I, there are moments that I liked and the characterizations I, I kind of liked, but it just feels like there's something missing there. And um, it does feel like uh, he's like almost getting there. But if with every film, he's like not close enough in terms of just capturing what makes a Studio Ghibli film so magical. And um, I remember, I'm going to go deep into <laughs> Ghibli lore and the Miyazaki father and son lore because I, I watched a, a while ago, like a, a year ago, the NH, NHK documentary series, 10 Years with Hayao Miyazaki, which uh, documented the 10 years leading up to the release of, pa uh, of Ponyo. And um, it starts off with the uh, premiere of Goro Miyazaki's From Up on Poppy Hill. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, the premiere of his film uh, Tales from Earthsea and the opening scene is basically the Studio Ghibli employees uh, filing into the theater to watch it for the first time and uh, Goro Miyazaki look looking very nervous and about 10 minutes into the film Hay Hayao Miyazaki walks out and um, is very uh, just basically it gives a very scathing response <laughs> to this film and you can see at the end of, of the, when the lights go up Goro Miyazaki's hands are like in his, his head is in his hands and he's just like an, a wreck. And it's, it's like, all right, well, I'm going too long on this and how fascinated I am by this whole father son dynamic. Um, but you see later on that from up on Poppy Hill, uh, Goro Miyazaki gets some help, some of it unasked from Hayao Miyazaki in terms of actually the, uh, the characterization and everything like that. And I wondered if maybe. Hayao Miyazaki was a little bit more hands-off with this film because it feels very much like it's still lost in terms of what it's trying to achieve uh, instead of ch achieving some of the potential that um, From Up on Poppy Hill had. Uh, sorry for my rant, my ramble about this. I, I, I haven't even gotten to the earwig and the witch that much. Uh, it's a movie... <laughs> It's a movie wait, about. Wait, 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 wait a second. Before you get to that issue, I have a hot take for you. And okay. Tell me if I'm totally wrong on that. Mm -hmm. But I think... Miyazaki makes incredible movies and I think Studio Ghibli the ones that are just produced by him are just they're they're fine they're sometimes good but not like I, I don't know I feel like there's a clear distinction of quality oh yeah from something that he directed 
for something he produced. Yeah, I think I think you're right there. Although I think there are some really underrated films that Hayao Miyazaki uh, didn't direct. Uh, Whisper of the Heart, for example, is a movie that comes from a story by Miyazaki, but is not directed by him. And it's one of Ghibli's best, most underrated gems. Um, but there is definitely a clear divide. And I think Studio Ghibli is still trying to figure out where it is as a studio without Hayao Miyazaki there, which is why it shuddered back when he announced that he was going to retire. So I think Ian Regan the Witch is an interesting first step in terms of the studio trying to figure out what it's doing without... Uh, with, not under the umbrella of Hayao Miyazaki. It's yeah. kind of a misstep. Um, I mean, there's some potential there, but uh, it's, it is charming, but it feels very much, it almost feels like a, a knockoff of a Ghibli film or like a Miyazaki film, if that makes sense, <laughs> which I feel really bad about. But um, yeah, Earwig and the Witch. Uh, it's all right, but it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, by the way, I did look this up. Uh, Catherine Hepburn um, had never done any, according to IMDb, <laughs> which could be wrong, had never done any comedy before and was coached by Howard Hawks and several veteran vaudevillians he employed so solely for this purpose. So there you go. Okay, uh, that, that answers that question that nobody wanted the answer to. I ben. wanted the answer, Ben. Oh, no, sorry. No, I wanted the answer, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> ben, what have you been watching? Uh, I caught up with a film called Critical Thinking that Brad has been sort of stumping for over the past year. And this is a movie that is directed by John Leguizamo. It also stars him. He plays a uh, sort of a coach or a teacher at a Miami high school. And he is like the guy who oversees like the, the chess club or the chess team. And it's basically like a, a, you know, one of those old chess movies where it's about, you know, this, this uh, sort of, um, up and coming team that nobody takes seriously and they, you know, rise up against all odds and sort of, uh, you know, d despite all of the, um, the societal, uh, uh, factors that are at play to sort of weigh them down, they end up overcoming that kind of stuff and, uh, end up becoming, you know, champions in their own right kind of deal. So, uh, it's, it's very formulaic, but it's very well done, very well executed. And I enjoyed watching it. So, um, you know, in terms of like, I, I would say it's it's one of those perfect movies that that just um, does exactly what it says it's going to do and nothing more. It's not going to like really, uh, you know, I, I doubt very seriously that this is going to be anybody's favorite movie or maybe even their favorite chess movie. But it, it is just very, very solid at what it, it sets out to do. And there is one moment in it um, that Brad argued for and ended up getting on our best movie moments of 2020 list. And uh even knowing what that moment was, because I, I participated in that conversation before I, I saw Critical Thinking, it still surprised me and still was very effective. So um, I would say that it, you know, having now seen it uh, and now that the list is already published, I will say uh, completely uselessly that it, that moment definitely does belong on that list. So um, yeah, so Critical Thinking, I think it's available uh, for rent on VOD right now. Um, it's got a good John Leguizamo performance at the at the center of it, and uh, you know it's it's just like Queen of Cotway or or any of the other sort of major chess movies. It's just a uh, yeah solid like right down the middle kind of movie. So critical thinking, pretty good. Uh, what else? I rewatched The Thin Man, which came out in 1934, and this is the movie that stars uh, William Powell and Myrna Loy as Nick and Nora Charles, who I think are widely considered like the best or one of the best uh, cinematic couples in, in movie history. Um, they, uh, Nick Charles is a retired detective and his wife is this really, really rich heiress. And they basically just like, don't have to do anything because the wife has so much money and their portrayal of, uh, of, of a relationship like a, a really successful marriage is just so much fun to watch. It's clear that those characters really, really love each other and um, are constantly like messing with each, messing with each other and, and like being really flirtatious. And um, you know, it, it, for so many movies that, that are just about crumbling relationships um, this is like the exact opposite. And, and it feels so good to watch them be this good at being that good to each other, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So um yeah, man, this movie, it's, it's a mystery. It's, 
uh, the detective basically, or former detective gets pulled into a case and his wife basically just like wants to see what he's got and wants to see if he still has it, uh, the ability to, to sort of crack this convoluted case. Um, and it's just a, a really super entertaining movie. And it definitely has that sort of rat-a-tat dialogue that HT was talking about that was sort of like representative of, of uh, comedies of this time. Um and it's just, yeah, like one of the best movies of this whole era, I would say. So if you're interested in, you know, that kind of dynamic between performers, um, definitely watch this movie. It's so, so much fun. So that is The Thin Man. And I believe this is streaming on HBO Max right now. So if you want to check that out, you can do it there. Uh, okay. HG, have you ever seen The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer by any chance? I know you're a Cary Grant fan. I haven't. And I, I actually hadn't heard of it until I saw that you put up a quarantine stream about it. <laughs> okay, so uh, this movie, I, the quarantine stream headline says that it has one of the most ludicrous premises in all of cinema, and I will stand by that because the the basic setup of The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, which came out in 1947 um, and stars Cary Grant and also Marin Loy, who's I just talked about from The Thin Man, uh, and Shirley Temple, as, like an older Shirley Temple. I had only known her as like, you know, the, the sort of child icon that everybody knows her as, you know, when she was whatever, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And here uh, she's, she's 44 actually... years old. <laughs> no, she's actually only, I think she was 19 when she filmed this. But I, even still, like just a teenage Shirley Temple was something I, I you know, I'd never seen her uh, <laughs> in a teenage role before. Um, but I thought she was she was pretty good. So anyway, the, the premise of The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, this movie is so nuts. Uh, Cary Grant plays this artist who is so, sort of like a, a dashing ne'er-do-well who is constantly getting in trouble with the law, but not really. He's like a, he's a good guy at heart, but he's constantly finding himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. He is accused of inciting a fight at a nightclub, and he goes before this judge, this female judge played by Marina Loy. He basically charms his way out of the situation, and uh, she sort of like clocks him and just says like, all right, you know, I, I got my eye on you, mister, but like, you know, be good basically. And like, lets everybody go. And then he goes to a high school and gives a lecture about art because he's an artist. And this 17 year old, 17 year old girl, uh, played by Shirley Temple sees him and instantly falls in love with him. And it turns out that Shirley Temple is the, is playing the sister of the judge character. And, uh, <laughs> This this teenage girl essentially throws herself at Cary Grant's character. He's, you know, 40-something at the time of, of filming. So there's a huge age gap there. And he knows that it's wildly inappropriate to be in a relationship with this girl. And he has no interest in it anyway. But through a convoluted series of events, uh, this girl ends up in his apartment late at night. And he gets arrested because people assume that nefarious things might have happened. They did not happen. Uh, but the, the crazy part of this setup is that instead of like charging this guy with a crime, the judge was the sister of this girl uh, decides to essentially give him a court order to date this 17 year old girl in this movie until she gets over her infatuation with him because they, they've decided that if they were to, put him in jail or, you know, charge him with any sort of serious crime that this girl's love for him would just grow exponentially because she would consider him to be like a martyr for this imaginary love that they have. And so he, instead of, you know, he obviously doesn't want to go to jail. So he goes along with this plan to, <laughs> to like be court ordered to date this girl. And the whole rest of this movie is just him like sort of begrudgingly going around on dates with this high school kid and like trying to get her to fall in love with somebody that's her own age. And like these crazy, I mean, as is, uh, as is common in movies of this time, the crazy misunderstandings and just, you know, uh, ludicrous antics play out from there. But um, man, what a, a crazy, crazy premise for a movie. But uh, Cary Grant is really, really enjoyable in this. Shirley Temple, like I said, this was the oldest I'd ever seen her in anything. I thought she, her character's a little much, but uh, I thought she did a good job with it. Um, and it was written by Sidney Sheldon, who went on to create uh, TV shows like I Dream of Jeannie and Heart to Heart. And he actually, this was his first screenplay and he won an Oscar for for writing it. So um, it's notable on that front too. So the movie is called The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer. I would recommend it just because it's it's so um, wild and obviously they would never make a movie like this today. But uh, this one is, is streaming on the Criterion channel right now. Um, and HD, if you get a chance to check this out, I'm, I'm very curious to see what you think because I know that you're like, you know, fluent in, in this whole uh, subgenre as well. So, Yeah, I might check it out now. 
Yeah, it's a weird one. Uh, and then His Girl Friday is the final movie that I saw. And I, I thought I had seen this. I, I don't think I actually had. If I did, maybe it was when I was a teenager and essentially I, I forgot everything. So rewatching it now uh, for the first time, this movie is streaming on Amazon right now. It was essentially like my first time watching it. Uh, this is another Cary Grant movie. This one uh, co-stars uh, Rosalind Russell and it is a, a newspaper movie. It's, it's about uh, Cary Grant plays a publisher and his ex-wife is uh, Rosalind Russell's character. And she used to be a, like his star reporter and she has moved on. She's engaged to this other guy. And uh, there's basically, she, she goes by the, the old newspaper office to say goodbye and to explain to her ex, like, Hey, I'm getting married now. And then they basically fall into one final story, which is this murderer or a guy who's been accused of murder, who may not actually be, uh, who may not have actually committed the crime. He's like about to be uh, executed. And so there's this whole thing where Cary Grant's character tries to essentially win his, his ex-wife back by pulling her back into the journalism game and getting her to cover this one last story. And then her, uh, her sort of frazzled uh, fiance character is trying to, you know, extract her from the situation as quickly as possible because Cary Grant is so charming and so devilish that uh, this fiance sort of gets the feeling that as soon you know, if, if she lets her guard down for a second, that that she might be pulled back into this this other world. Um, but yeah, it's. Um, I mean, frankly, it reminded me a little bit of Bringing Up Baby in in that it was so much. It, it like the dialogue is insane. I mean, the Thin Man I think is like the perfect um, amount of like ratatat back and forth, uh, kind of suave, uh, witty jokes and banter. And this movie, people are talking over each other all the time. It's, t it's almost impossible to understand unless you're watching it with subtitles on, um, which I, I was, but, uh, man, there's just, there's so much happening. It is really another one of those movies that really just feels cranked all the way up to 11. So, um, if you're, you know, like if you, if you're trying to pick a movie that, uh, has yeah. like a little bit of a, if you're looking for a come down at the end of the night, you know, like Peter, you're talking about like watching stuff or, or listening to stuff and trying to fall asleep to, this is absolutely not that movie because it will like <laughs> amp you up. You'll be like, what the hell is going on? Um, but yeah, his girl Friday is, uh, I mean, it's a classic and I, I can see why I just don't know that it's like one of my most beloved movies from, you know, the, the screwball genre. I but, just want to uh, say I adore His Girl Friday. I watch it all the time. Oh, okay. The Amazon version. Did you – was the version that you watched uh, surprisingly of poor quality? Because I remember last time I watched it on Amazon, it was terrible quality. I actually didn't watch it on Amazon. I watched it on Turner Classic Movies, but and I just recommended that it was on Amazon because that's the only place that I saw that it was streaming. So I wanted our listeners to be able to watch it, but I, I didn't watch it that way. So um, yeah, that's that sucks if it's uh, like a terrible transfer or something. It looked pretty good on, on Turner Classic yeah, Movies. It looks, it looks pretty awful on Amazon, unfortunately. The dialogue and, and the performances still sing off the screen, but uh, you won't be able to see much <laughs> of it because it's just, it's really grainy. I don't know what they did with that transfer. Huh. huh. Okay. Uh, let's move on to what we've been eating. I actually have an intro this week. I, I, um, in LA, there's these restaurants that become the hot thing to get or go to in LA it tends to be like the cycle. And then like everybody wants it, but they can't get it. Or you got to wait like, you know, hours in line to get it. Or, you know, you need to make reservations a month in advance and those reservations sell out. Uh, this is one of those things. One of the things that I've uh, wanted to have for so long is this thing called bootleg pizza. And it's been one of these things where it's been a pop up, I think, uh, five nights a week in different areas of L.A. And they would make these pizzas and they uh, you'd see them all over your Instagram if you were in L.A. Uh, they're kind of like very Instagrammable. And to get them, you actually had to like make reservations for uh, like a time slot. Like I think they did time slots in every like tw like 20 minutes of an hour or something. And you had to do that like a month in advance. And every time I tried to do it, uh, I just never got a time slot. They would sell out like really quickly. Um, they they got so big that they actually got a location uh, in, I guess, like mid city Hollywood area. Uh, so they actually have a restaurant that no one can actually eat at, but they are now on Postmates, which makes it much easier to get bootleg pizza. So I actually got a bootleg pizza last week. I was uh, feeling kind of crappy because of uh, everything that was happening last Wednesday, and I decided to have a cheat meal because, you know, that's what you do. And um, 
it's it's hard to describe. It's like this like a uh, square pizza. It's kind of like Sicilian looking. It's also kind of like a Detroit pizza, if you know what a Detroit pizza, but it's also thick, almost like a deep dish, but it isn't like a, like a um it isn't a deep dish. It's more thick in its uh dough. Um, but uh it, it is slightly charred or burnt, which when I put photos up of it on my Instagram and Twitter, like it was funny, like it was like a split half half of like half people were like, This is incredible, where can I get this? Uh and uh the other half was like, ew, it's burnt. So um it was I will say this. The they have a cheese Louise, which is the cheese, which I amazing, probably my favorite one of my favorite pizzas in LA. I think my other favorite pizza is uh, Hollywood Pies, which is a deep dish. Um and we also got the pepped up or something it's the pepperoni one that one was a little bit more burnt or charred and i i didn't like that as much i don't really like pepperoni anyways it's just um that's one of their popular ones so i wanted to try both i will say that if you do live in la and you do end up ordering from bootleg pizza th these things look small but they are so thick so i would say if you are two people you could probably do it just one pizza one of these like square pizzas even though it looks so small. Even when it arrived, it came in like the small cardboard box and Kittrell was like, this is so small. You paid 20 bucks for that. And then like, you know, she, she had like two slices and was like done. <laughs> but um, I'd highly recommend it. So if you're in L.A., try bootleg pizza. Uh, it is amazing. I think it's probably similar to. Um, what's that place that the Russo brothers talk about in New York City? Do you know, H.D.? It's a. Uh, print something print print street pizza maybe i was thinking of joe's pizza because that's the one that yeah. is pretty famous for in new, in new york but i don't know print street pizza is it yes oh, okay. so it's like I'm this wrong. square pie and it has like, like their pepperoni one has like more pepperonis than it has cheese it's like insane i don't know it, it reminds me of that so if you've ever had that it, it looks very much the same uh brad you've been eating a lot of stuff this week and including the brookios i have not found these the Oreo Brookio cookies, how are they? Yes, uh, Oreo has a new variant. They they keep putting out just crazy flavors all the time, and this is the the Brookio where it's the standard Oreo cookie, but it has three different creams uh, inside of it. It has the regular Oreo cream, uh, it has their brownie batter cream, and a cookie dough cream in between the cookies. So it's basically like a kind of like a triple stuff Oreo uh, with uh, three different creams, and they are so so good. The mixture of the three creams. Uh, is fantastic. It's definitely one of my uh, favorite Oreos that they come out with in recent memory. I, I'm usually like, you know, fairly agreeable when it comes to the new flavors. There, there haven't really been many that like I've hated. Most of them, I'm like, oh, these are pretty good, but they're usually not ones where I'm like, I definitely want to go out and get like another pack of these uh, immediately. But these are are so good. Um, and so if yeah, if you can go out and find them there, I found mine at Target. They should be available uh, pretty much everywhere. If they're not there yet, just keep an eye out because they're probably just slowly making their way. Uh, out to stores, but uh, definitely pick these up because they're they're really really good. What else have you been eating? Um, on the same cookie kind of plane, I guess. Um, Dove has these um new chocolates that they've released for Valentine's Day. They're it's a midnight fudge cookie, and it's their standard little like um I don't know, like rounded square chocolate pieces that they always release around holidays and stuff. But uh, this one, the the chocolate tastes like it's. Maybe a little bit more of a, a dark chocolate, but not quite. Like a, almost like a mixture of of it. Um, it's I imagine it's just because it's their their fudge formula, um, and it has these cookie crumbles in it. And so it's not quite as good as as other similar um, combinations of like the, of cookie and chocolate. Simply because I think whenever you have like cookies and chocolate, I just think it's better if it's just a flat out uh, milk chocolate. Like Hershey's has a really great uh, cho like chocolate and cookie crumble bar um, that I really like. So but these these are pretty good. Um, not not amazing. And then uh, Crave, there's a new version of Crave, which is like um, a cereal that has like a, a crispy outer pocket. And then inside is it's like a, a softer, like kind of like frosting, I guess you could say. And they have different flavor variations. And their new one is chocolate chip cookie dough. And it's the, the outer cereal shell is what is, uh, I guess, technically chocolate chip cookie dough flavored. And I expected it to taste akin to like Cookie Crisp or the Chips Ahoy cereal. But it's a little different to give it that like that artificial cookie dough flavor, um, and it's it's 
fine. I think what makes it better than it otherwise would be if it was just the cereal is the fact that it has the chocolate cream in the middle of it. And it still has the problem with most Crave cereals I find where I think that the, the Crave cereal just gets soggy too quickly and it kind of ruins it because I like I, I don't let my cereal sit for too long. I like it to be crispy when I have it in the milk rather than getting, you know, soggy because of the milk. Um, and so I always have a problem with Crave where I feel like it gets uh, just soft too quickly. But uh, this it's, it's still pretty good. It's kind of a weird, uh, weird seeing the cereal because the cereal itself looks like it has poppy seeds on it, even though it doesn't. And so like it kind of psychs you out and makes you think like you're going to like taste poppy seeds while you're eating your cereal. But it's OK. Um, there's also, uh, I, I got these around Christmas actually, um, in my, my stocking from my parents and I just tried them, uh, Bailey's Irish cream truffles. So Bailey's Irish cream is uh, an alcoholic beverage. Um, it's, uh, an Irish cream flavored and you, it's usually good. At, um, you can have it on ice, you know, just by itself, but it's usually good for like mixing drinks and stuff like that. And so, uh, they made truffles. They're, they're non-alcoholic. They just taste like Irish cream and they're branded by Bailey's. And these are really, really good. Uh, even without the little, uh, alcohol kick that Bailey's usually has, uh, the flavor of the, the cream inside these truffles is, is awesome. So I don't know if they're, you can easily find them since now it's after Christmas. And I don't know if they were like, um, easier to find because of the holiday season, but if you can track them down, they're really good. And then, uh, Going back to cereal, so there's Cinnamon Toast Crunch, there's Cinnamon Toast Crunch Churros, and there's also Chocolate Cinnamon Toast Crunch, three separate cereals. And I've, I've talked about doing the churros before. I don't know if I've ever talked about Chocolate Cinnamon Toast Crunch on here because it's been so long since I had it for the first time. But now they have Cinnamon Toast Crunch Chocolate Churros, bringing all that nonsense together. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Um, so is it just chocolate cinnamon is what it is? So basically, and like, I, it's been so long since I've had chocolate cinnamon toast crunch that I, I don't necessarily remember um, how well like the, the cinnamon and chocolate went together. But this one in particular, I don't know if because if it's because their churro formula is just slightly different because of the cereal pieces. But when I was eating this, I found myself um, t- feeling like it tasted almost like a Mexican hot chocolate kind of cereal. Because um, it's what's great about the churro pieces is uh, they stay uh, really crispy for a while in, in the milk. And so there's a, gr- a great crunch to it. And the chocolate flavor is good. And, but the cinnamon adds a whole other layer to it. And I found myself that, that um, think really being reminded of Mexican hot chocolate because of how the cinnamon mixes with the chocolate. Because usually in you know, uh, Mexican hot chocolate recipes, it's usually like a chili powder or a cayenne pepper, something that you put in it to give it like just, just a little bit of a spice. Um, and cinnamon obviously isn't, you know, as spicy as that, but just the, the mixture of it with the chocolate, um, really made me feel like wish almost that, you know, there was like a Mexican hot chocolate cereal. Cause that's, it really is what it tastes like. So there you go. Is that all you've ate this past week? I, I, th- I think that's it. That's, I mean, <laughs> if, if that isn't enough. Okay. Uh, let's move on to what we've been playing. Jacob, what have you been playing? Yeah, I'll go through this pretty briskly. I played a few board games. I played, uh. Conspiracy of the Solomon Gambit, which is actually a old board game from the 70s. has been tidied up by Restoration Games, a company who takes older game designs and fine-tunes them and uh, makes them palatable and improved for modern audiences. And this one is really interesting. It's a Cold War spy game where each player is a different spy agency, a different corner of Europe. And your job is to get a briefcase to your spy agency. And once you get it into your home nation, you win the game immediately. However, you do this by... Behind a screen, you have money, and you use it to essentially pay uh, freelance espionage contractors, you know, uh, freelance spies on the board to move them around. And they all have special powers. Like some can, like, push the briefcase away from them. Some can pull it toward them. Some can move twice. And the idea being is that you do not know which spy is in whose pocket because you don't know who's paying who. So it's actually this game of uh, of bidding and auctioning um, in secret over who controls which spies. And it gets really intense because... You may think you have someone in your pocket, but somebody else actually does. Then you can activate an ability to try to assassinate that spy. So you, you realize somebody's put all their money on one spy. So you kill that spy and they've wasted all their money. It has a really, really fun back and forth. It's really unique in how you don't actually control anyone on the board. You influence them behind your screen using money to see which spy is currently you know, working for you in secret versus who everyone else thinks they have. Uh, it's a really, really strong board game. It's really, really fun. And especially... Uh, I. I imagine this would be more fun with, with a higher player count because in pandemic, I have not tried that yet, but even with smaller player count, I'm enjoying it a lot. And that is a uh, conspiracy, the Solomon gambit. Peter, have you played this one? I have not. I have, I have not played board games in like over a year now at this point, Jacob. It's really sad. 
Actually, no, that's not true. I played some board games over Zoom, but not anything substantial. But well, this sounds like fun. Yeah, it is fun. And hopefully vaccine if you're on the speeder and you can give it a shot. Uh, I recommend it. Uh, but a good solo board game, uh, Marvel Champions. This actually can be played with, with more people. Uh, I've played it with my wife. We both enjoyed it as a, as a duo. But I've been playing a lot of it solo. And it's it's a cooperative board game. Uh, it's you against the game itself. And it's simple. You play as Marvel superheroes. And the core box has like Iron Man and Black Panther and She-Hulk and Captain Marvel and Spider-Man. And you can buy expansions to add more heroes and more villains. It's a uh, it's not like a groundbreaking card game. It's not doing anything truly new or exciting, but it is very flavorful. It really it really captures a lot of uh, Marvel superhero action in it. And I picked up the rules very quickly. So even though it's not like Fantasy Flight, the company makes it has made really incredible card games. I feel like they're breaking the mold. Like the the late great Netrunner or the Arkham Horror card game really feel like they're taking card games in really bold exciting directions marvel Chambers is not that it's meant to be a game that you can pick up pretty quickly play with your family expand in the direction you want to if you want to play as ant-man or ant-man expansion for example uh but i'm i'm enjoying it quite a bit uh just put on deadliest catch and deal out a round of marvel champions it's been a pretty common evening for me over the past few weeks and i've been enjoying it quite a bit have you played Marvel United? Because that's a game I got on Kickstarter. I still have not. I got a new chance to play because it came during this uh, last the last horrible year. But uh, like, I, I don't hear anybody talking about it. No, I've not played Marvel United. I'm, um, not, I, there are a lot of Marvel board games, and I I'm trying to you know divide myself amongst things that aren't Marvel. So I, I, I Marvel Champions the card game and the Marvel Crisis Protocol miniatures game which is, requires assembly and painting and all that are my two Marvel hobbies. And I'm I maybe if I hear good things about Marvel United in a while, after a while I'll pick it up but like you said it's been pretty quiet. That was a game was a pretty big Kickstarter hit. And the reason I don't back Kickstarter games is that if the game is actually good, if it's actually a great game, it will be available after the fact. It will it will get a second print run, it'll be available. And but here's the problem, Jacob. It'll be available, but without all the extras. If, 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 if the extras are part of a necessity, if the extras are necessary, if they are truly <laughs> part of, if they make the game experience complete, then screw the company for making them an extra. You know, it, yeah. I, I, I only want to play a game that is good and stands on its own, which is why I refuse to back, <laughs> back uh, Kickstarter games at this point. So, but you should play it, Peter, and let me know because. <laughs> I know it's not that expensive and has really cool miniatures. These sort of like cartoonish, uh, almost anime versions of the Marvel heroes. They're like very adorable. I'll have to check it out. I just did a search of Marvel board games. Did you know they make a Marvel version of Apples to Apples? Oh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're, there's literally, if there's a way they can make money off the Marvel name, they have done it. <laughs> but I can I can personally vouch for Marvel Champions <laughs> as being a, a strong card game. Like okay. the, Nothing amazing, but if you like Marvel and you like a good cooperative card game that's just about putting your like playing cards in the right way to have a Marvel experience in a way that is challenging without being like bloodying. Uh, it's good. Uh, in terms of video games, I just want to quickly uh, talk about uh, the Resident Evil three remake. I last year or maybe the year before I spoke about the Resident Evil two remake and how I thought it was one of the best video games I've played in a long, long time. And the Resident Evil three remake, like these remakes of games from the, from the nineties, they've been, totally overhauled graphically engine wise story wise and Resident Evil 3 is not nearly as good as Resident Evil 2 both the original and the remake uh but it's still very good if you can get it cheap you should definitely play it but you should play Resident Evil 2 remake first I will say that these games since they're remakes of the you know classic ones from the 90s with the new Resident Evil movie recently wrapped I really hope that they use these games as their template because it's such an ideal blend of action and horror as opposed to the you know previous six movies of the of the pre-reboot franchise which are straight up goofy action movies which i i enjoy but the resident evil series is as best when it's frightening when it's scary when it's when it's leaning on the horror and resident evil 2 and 3 have a lot of shooting things they you shoot a lot of monsters and get a lot of gunfights but it always feels like you're almost out of bullets it almost feels like you're always about to die it's you're on a knife's edge between life and death and that's what makes it exciting which brings me to resident evil 7 an older game maybe three or four years now that i just got around to playing and beating and it's great. It's really terrific. It is very different than Resident Evil 3 and Resident Evil 2 remakes in that it's not an action game. It is a first person horror game where it has very loose connections to the larger franchise. You don't understand how it's connected until very late in the game and a very satisfying reveal. I won't spoil here. Uh, but 
most of the game is you running because you don't have the ammunition to take down enemies. You're being chased by things that can't die. And it's running and hiding and uh, trying to map out your route through the house that you're trapped in for the first chunk of the game. And it is terrifying. Uh, I know it was also released for PlayStation VR. I cannot imagine playing this game in VR. It would, it would give you a panic attack immediately. Uh, but yeah, uh, the Resident Evil 3, Resident Evil 2 remakes, and Resident Evil 7 are now all pretty cheap on whatever system you're playing on. They're available, you know, Xbox One, PlayStation 4. I played them on the PlayStation 5, where they're also available. And they're all great games. I mean, the Resident Evil Renaissance is very real. I mean, especially after the fifth and sixth games let a lot of people down, like in a major way, over 10 years ago. Uh, Capcom went back to the drawing board, and the new games are all really excellent and really marks a, a future where I'm excited about Resident Evil again. And it's a really cool feeling. They're all really good. That's it. Okay, that brings us to the end of today's Slash Home Daily. You can find more of all of our work at SlashHome.com. You can find this podcast on Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at Peter at SlashHome.com. And please rate and read this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we'll see you tomorrow. Peter, it's been too long. I, I have in front of me the gargantuan book. I thought, uh, the wait, gargantuan no, book of insult, we, offense, we haven't we, sharp retorts for public. No one, J- Jacob. No, no one, no, no one has complained. Like, we, we haven't had this. No one, no one even mentioned anything. I think people Peter, are fine. Several with people on Twitter were disappointed and added, added me, added, replied me directly to say that they missed the joke book. So I'll say the title again since you spoke over me. The Grantuan Book of Insult, Offense, and Affrontery. Sharp retorts for post, caustic quips, and impolite put downs by our Lord and Savior, Louis A. Safian. <laughs> I've opened to page 129. He's our Lord and Savior, but we don't even know if he's an actual person. Oh, he's real. He's, he's, he's very real, Peter. Uh, juvenile delinquents, page 129, juvenile delinquents. Uh, Peter, you carry a blackjack in your pencil box. Um. <laughs> what is a black like blackjack like you carry a blackjack in your pencil box so that's like a like an ace and a king peter you carry a blackjack in your pencil box <laughs> i don't understand peter you carry a blackjack <laughs> in your pencil box <laughs> i mean technically i am a magician and I have boxes of tricks, and some of them are related to blackjack, so I, I, I guess that's true. Peter. <laughs> okay, so I, I think box. we have to establish that I think the blackjack that Jacob is referring to is that tiny little thing that like people used to beat each other over, beat each yeah. other over the head oh. with in like you know the 1930s or whatever. Yeah, it's ben a very gets the joke. Thing. Ben yeah. gets the joke. Anyway, now, now, now we have context. <laughs> Peter, you carry a blackjack in your pencil box. Uh... Because you're a juvenile this delinquent. Joke, this joke must have been so much more funnier or more was. <laughs> it, Let's it, move it, on, shall we? Next yeah, joke, but... please. <laughs> Brad, Brad, he's playing that nice old game of hopscotch. Only trouble is, he's playing it with real scotch. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> it's the best one I've ever read. Okay, here we go. Ben, Ben Pearson, he's very careful about his health. He only smokes filter tipped marijuanas. <laughs> filter tipped marijuanas with an S? Oh man. Wait, is that even a thing? <laughs> it sure know. is. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, Chris, uh, his parents give him a free hand, but not in the proper place. Wow. That's oh my goodness. Uh, and oh, wait, is that is this is, is that it's like suggesting molest, molest, like is someone molesting Chris? Is that what's no, going on? He's being slapped across the face because he's a juvenile delinquent. Oh, Get your mind the out of gutter. Okay, okay. Get your mind out of those. Low, I don't know. I'm trying to think like 1930s. What's going on here? All right. Uh, last one. HT, she's an honor student. She's always saying, Yes, your honor. No, your honor. Ah, uh, I'm a juvenile delinquent. Uh, this section is gold. It's only a page long, and everyone is like deeply offensive or amazing. Um, Why don't you bookmark this section for next time? I, I may. Oh my goodness! All of you just joined a union, a teenage muggers union. <laughs> Sign me up. Do uh, they have health care? <laughs> <laughs>